six in a weekly series which has gone back obviously 86 programs one hour every week and uh, covered a lot of ground during those times May, what's uh, on tap today? Can you summarize briefly uh, what people can look forward to in uh, the next hour or so? Uh, yes, I, I think we'll take a few articles that were in the news this week, uh, the Civil Liberties Union going into the Alger Hiss information, wanting to dig that out now uh, to get that, open that case up for some people. And uh, the mention of Roy Ash, Richard Nixon is sitting at Camp David designing his new domestic program, a part of which I predicted a long time ago on these shows we did some... Uh, discussions of what it would be like the next four years, and he's called Mr. Roy Ash down there to help him design that domestic program, which is going to be presented to the public in its formal sense. Two years ago, it surfaced what he had in mind if he was reelected. We'll talk about that. I want to talk about the Billy Smith trial here on the Monterey Peninsula and uh, how it fits in with some of the research I've done and some behind-the-scenes uh, confrontation I have with Luke McKissick and of course everybody's glad with the outcome but I want to discuss um, it from the terms of political conspiracies an attorney who's worked with Sirhan Sirhan and now with Billy Smith and discuss those cases uh, some experiences the one I had with Luke McKissick and then I brought a letter that somebody wrote to me in um, September that I never got around to answering. We yeah, were so I, I busy. I was going to just say to you that there's a whole pile of mail which I gave to you when you walked into the station today. Yeah. And I was going to say, oh, gee, May, May's getting around to those letters and she's going to answer them right away. Well, this <laughs> is we're what I answering a letter from September. We'll have faith, folks. Keep writing. <laughs> She's got a whole stack of letters that came in in the last yeah. couple of days, and they're sitting there, and I guess those will be answered in March. Oh, no, those that, that I send out copies of the Realist or information, I'll answer those right away. But when I answer them on a program, every week at the Watergate and things were piling up here, and I never had a chance, we'll try to get to those. Um, the article about the uh, Civil Liberties Union, uh, they're asking the FBI to force the files open on the Alger Hiss case, which is interesting. And on a case which was called Operation Keelhaul at the end of World War II. With the new Freedom of Information Act, which was passed in 1966, it declared that the government cannot have unwarranted secrecy on a lot of matters. And a, a person is writing a book, Alan Weinstein, professor of history of American studies at Smith College, is writing a book on the Alger Hiss case. And that is far from closed. The Hiss case could take a lot more examination. This is the case that made Richard Nixon uh, running away and his political success, the use of Whitaker Chambers to come down on Alger Hiss, and then the article I did in The Realist, I referred to Nixon and his career and the Alger Hiss case, and I feel that this opening of historians is very important because a lot is locked up, just like the National Archives locks up things on the John Kennedy assassination, the real story of all of the provocateurs, and this was a case of an agent framing Alger Hiss, uh, will be unraveled. The period of the 60s and 70s, someday, America will look back and shake their head when the real evidence comes in about many of these cases. Because Do you think including the Alger Hiss case? Oh, yes. Yeah, Alger Hiss has said all along that he was innocent, and I believe that this was a real important strategy in the Cold War in this country to help uh, revamp our domestic and foreign policy and put certain people in power through the Red Scare. So in the paper uh, this week was this article about opening this up and uh, uh, the archives may hold on to it. The Operation Keyhole, I wonder, it may be like Operation Paperclip, which was the uh, importation of American Nazis into this country, which is still locked up. And some authors are asking for that because it has to do with the forced repatriation after World War II of Russian and Eastern European citizens. And they were prisoners of war by America and Britain. And many of those came to this country to become espionage agents later. And there are three people asking the Pentagon to release their records on Operation Keelhaul, which happened in World War II. A lot of the secrets of who was brought over here from Nazi Germany are locked in Washington and should be available. Now, you want the archives open because of the material contained therein about the, the assassinations. Yes. Right? The, uh -huh. Specifically the John Kennedy assassination. And there's information there on the Robert Kennedy assassination and also locked up our uh, papers of um, James Ray, the alleged assassin against Martin Luther King. None of this is public, available to the public. Well, how does the Freedom of Information Act relate to the material 
which is in the National Archives. Does it cover any of that material? Well, the Freedom of Information Act says that everything should be available except in cases of national security, and yet every lawyer that's tried to get access to all this information on the various assassinations gets an answer, you can't have the material. So, uh, so all this material is then classified as national pertaining to national security? Well, it certainly pertains to somebody's security. I know who. They're sitting, you know, in the White House, and, and it's locked up. It, it's just a face-saving device to keep people from understanding the power structure of the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now, people who have listened to this program have written their congressmen, their senators, about the uh, National Archives, and I think you received copies of of those letters in the past, and we've mentioned some of those on past programs. What's been the, the general reaction of members of Congress toward reopening the National Archives? Well, the, the reaction of Congress to the Archives is like it is to everything else. When they have to vote on whether Abrams should be promoted to the head of the Army, uh, the election, what was it, in the Senate, 87 to 2, and some were absent, the reaction of people, if, if they give the President carte blanche to have the war or money for the war, there's nobody in Congress uh, I say nobody. Well, I don't know who would work to open the archives. I haven't heard one senator or congressman ask for the information on the political assassinations. Well, you showed me a couple of letters where they beat the around answers, the bush. Yeah, the answers weren't really answers. They were. That's right. They weren't almost form letters without being form letters. They they just sent the conditions under with which the archives are locked. But a congressman wouldn't you know, commit himself. Muskie wouldn't. McGovern wouldn't. They won't take a position on that. The assassinations is just still too sensitive uh, for them to touch or else they each are conditioned by certain threats, whatever it is. Uh, they just don't want to go into that subject. They won't end the conversation by making the material available. That would end it once and for all because they could say, see, you want to see it. There's no conspiracy. The conversation about uh, conspiracies isn't over, but they won't open it up. There was an article, uh, an interview of Ramsey Clark, one of the favorites of the liberals or the young people, they think he's really far out, and I feel that he is not at all. And the L.A. Star had an interview with Ramsey Clark, and there's a certain inconsistency with his, his Vietnam role and with the Berrigans, defending the Berrigans. And in the interview, it was this last week in the L.A. Star, dated November the 9th, they said, could you tell us about your feud with Jim Garrison and his investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy? Well, Ramsey Clark was putting down Jim Garrison and well, Garrison now, to uh, fill people in who, who don't know Garrison, he felt he had enough evidence to indicate there was a plot to assassinate John Kennedy. Is that right? That's right. And and he. So what did Ramsey Clark? How did Ramsey Clark handle? Well, Ramsey Clark was the Attorney General, and he put down Garrison, and he he made fun of his investigation. And Garrison, then Attorney General of uh, Gar Louisiana, no, or, uh, uh, New Orleans. No, Ramsey Clark was Attorney General of the United States. Right, but yeah. Garrison. Garrison was, was a district, district attorney, attorney in New Orleans. New Orleans, and he wouldn't cooperate with them at all. And Ramsey Clark was the Attorney General at the time that Martin Luther King was killed, who okay. said lone assassin, no conspiracy, the very night that he was killed. And he went out of his way to put down Jim Garrison and to interrupt the uh, uh, trial with Clay Shaw. So they, the interview in the L.A. Free Press felt there was this inconsistency in what, what was your uh, problem with Jim Garrison. L.A. Star, right? The L.A. Star, yeah. And he said, well, Garrison made statements and allegations that were half-truths. And he began to say, he said, Garrison said there was a conspiracy that the Warren Com Commission didn't cover, that the Warren Commission failed to investigate. But... Uh, Ramsey Clark feels that they investigated adequately. Then he changed the subject and went on to say that in New York, New York City there was a study of mental illness of children, severe mental illness, and that there are many children, he, this is what he said in quotes, there are types of children, and I really hate to repeat this, but it sure makes a point that Sir Hannah and Oswald were. Maybe that's where it comes from. We can solve, you know, to study what it is, he thinks the children have mental illness, poverty, family breakup caused by poverty, family sickness, alcoholism. He said, I think that Jim Garrison knew how the country felt, and I believe when he indicted Clay Shaw, and you see, Ramsey Clark just wanders on in this interview. He hardly makes sense. He says he has no tru truth about it, but he believes that Clay Shaw was innocent and had nothing to do with the assassination and that Jim Garrison should worry about the mental illness of Sirhan and Oswald. Oswald had, you know, this is from Ramsey Clark, and, you know, like, you shake your head, but, you know, we've read on the program Oswald's training in the Marines and his electronic radar There's training. There's no indication his, that uh, 
Was there ever any mention in the Warren Commission that, or any suggestion that Lee Harvey Oswald was mentally disturbed? None at all. Not at all. He went to. So there really isn't any basis for he had ta- that's Clark's right. statement. Well, this is or right. Implica- implication, really. The only reason is, is that he's playing a double role like a provocateur. He's still an agent of the government, which many people realize he is. But he comes out with people, the Berrigans, or travels to Vietnam with McGovern and plays the outward liberal, similar to uh, many people employed by the government that are playing this double role. Ramsey Clark would never open up anything to do with these assassinations, and he passes it off that the boys are mentally ill. Well, the problem in Los Angeles with the Sirhan case isn't that Sirhan's mentally ill, but that the bullets don't match the gun that he was supposed to have fired from. And in the same uh, paper, the L.A. Star, that had the thing by Ramsey Clark, was a, that ad for a book that we read on the radio show once, if people want to order it, called The Killing of Robert Kennedy. And the address is Echo Park Commission on Law and Order, P.O. Box 26561, Edendale Station, E-D-E-N-D-A-L-E, Station, L-A-90026. It's 698. I don't know if any of you listening have bought that book yet, but it's really interesting. It really is. And in the same paper where Ramsey Clark is saying that Sirhan is mentally ill, the uh, L.A. Star is is running an ad for a book which would show Sirhan, uh, the book shows through legal documents and, and police records and things the fact that there was seven second gun in the Ambassador Hotel and that Sirhan did not shoot the fatal bullet. Uh, so that Ramsey Clark is playing a really uh, double game there and I, people want to know, they go on a personality cult that if you have a beard and a free Huey Newton over your desk and you work with uh, servicemen out at Fort Ord that, that want to get out of the service that are conscientious objectors. Therefore, you're a liberal. But it turned out that Donald Segretti, Army Intelligence, was doing all these things, and he was flying directly back to Washington and working with the Treasury Department and worked in the intelligence system. So um, uh, it doesn't mean the outward appearance doesn't mean anything. It's the way you perform what you're going to do. Oh, Phil, you wanted me to talk about Lewis Tackwood. Uh, there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are a few people that are expecting him to be on the radio at this very moment. Yes, we have a disappointment for some people, but you didn't announce it ahead on the air, did you? No, just to a few people oh. uh, privately, and I guess now is the time to let them know that Tackwood, uh, unless oh. I don't see him anywhere around. <laughs> Lewis, where are you? Lewis is not here. No, I thought we had a treat for you um, today, but hold on, it'll be coming. I am in contact with Lewis Tackwood. And I think we've mentioned him on at least 20 shows. On, you know, he, I think he's one of the most important persons walking around this country today in terms of power structure. If you don't like what's going on and if you didn't like um, that particular election, you don't like the people in office, there's still something you can do about it. And uh, Tackwood surfaced once at a press, press conference, made allegations about the... Justice Department in Los Angeles, the Police Department, the State Justice, and the National that are all linked together. Uh, one reason he may not have been up, he was supposed to be up this weekend. Uh, when I spoke to him, he was heavily trailed, and he, he tailed, and he didn't have much money. And he didn't know whether to take a plane or the bus or cabs because he has to lose his traces. The LAPD follows him all the time. And it may be that he couldn't get on the transportation that he was coming. He was to arrive this weekend. Yeah, well, we'll try and get him up here, though. He's, I'm sure he's going to do what's safe, and he's not going to come at a time, you know, um, where he thinks he's followed. Well, Tackwood says he was a a police undercover agent, right? Yeah, he was for nine years, and uh, now he's at Warner Brothers making a movie about the CIA <laughs> with Marchetti. Victor Marchetti of the CIA is going out to Warner Brothers, and uh, it seems that the studios are getting a little angry at the amount of movies coming out against the mafia. You know, the we will have we will have Lewis Tackwood as a guest, but I think now it, it wouldn't be good to announce it because his appearance in town will be by surprise at some time, and uh, he comes and goes and, and doesn't like to leave a trail, you know. He doesn't like to be tailed, so he'll be here. Okay. And Just wanted to get that on for the benefit of those who are expecting him uh, to walk in and uh, make his presence known. But he ain't here. Yeah. He but if you keep listening every week, you will be here. Um, I wanted to talk briefly. Be- Sounds like a come on. But, uh, it's got to be, of course. Yeah. We've got okay. to be. I, I want to talk about the Nixon plan um, to shake up. The White House was assistants were summoned 
to a conference at Camp David, and I brought in the article just to branch and be, mention it briefly because I got about six phone calls uh, this week when it was in the Chronicle and the uh, San Jose Mercury. It had to do with the fact that Roy Ash from Linton Industries was called down to Camp David to make organizational changes in the cabinet, in the running of the government with the cabinet members. And in the article that I did in The Realist, um, the issue why was why was Marcia, Martha Mitchell kidnapped, um, persons remembered the mention of Roy Ash in the article. On page 30, and I'll quote it, it said, This year, 1972, is the most important year in American history. Provisions have been made to eliminate the outdated Constitution. The new version of democratic rights does not resemble anything but a fascist dictatorship. A new cabinet designed by Roy Ash of Linton Industries would trim away every department except those of defense, treasury, state, and the Justice Department. Now, this little cabinet arrangement has been designed for a couple of years, but uh, Richard Nixon had what he called a tax reform, the American Revolution, but he couldn't present it until after the election. It was done by Roy Ash, too. Uh, because the people would get angry. And the cabinet uh, reconstruction was consists of Department of State, Department of Treasury, Department of Defense, and Department of Justice. And then all the other major cabinet departments would be reshuffled. Now, the, the idea was to make it work more efficiently, but all the civil rights people will be resigning. They've been asked to resign. The, every member of the cabinet has been asked to turn in his resignation. And the plan is a much closer, tighter control. And the thing that frightens me is that the department, for example, that takes care of the ecology, the resources, um, when I read a list of the people that contributed to Richard Nixon and the people who were involved with the espionage uh, funding of the money, particularly the group in Houston, Texas, and I mentioned uh, last week, I think, that lawsuit about them having um, a plant up in Idaho that's being contaminated and they're throwing zinc into the water, and the fish are dying, and there was a suit before the Justice Department against their company polluting the water and the natural resources of Idaho. And this particular firm gave Nixon 100000 plus, a lot more, for his reelection, and the suits were dropped off, and the Justice Department hasn't done anything for six months. And that came out again this week. And up in, in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and the automobile factories, I have a list of I don't know how many cases of anti-pollution uh, cases that are going now. And Marie Stans, the fundraiser for Richard Nixon, the former Secretary of Commerce, would offer these people positions on the ecology boards if they would donate to the campaign of Richard Nixon. <laughs> and um, Roy Ash is the last person to be concerned with ecology, you see. And they're taking away all these things and combining them into a very tight structure. And the people who fund it, uh, Richard Nixon will get positions under these departments. They'll be accountable only to the president. And along with Roy Ash shaking up the government was an article that it can't keep his gain this week that the foreign policy makers were meeting with Richard Nixon. And it said Richard Nixon met with his wise house aides, H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, working into the night on Thursday on the foreign policy structure. Well, Haldeman and Ehrlichman know nothing about foreign policy. This is really frightening because, you see, I know that Nixon gets his instructions. And these two men came out of that G. Walter Thompson advertising agency in Los Angeles. Ehrlichman was in charge of domestic affairs the last four years and completely blundered that. It was disgusting. So now you have Haldeman and Ehrlichman staying up in the late hours of the night working on foreign policy structure, and then it goes on to say no State Department representatives were present. Now, I keep pointing these things out. Now, people may say, uh, what has this got to do with conspiracy? Because we used to talk about the evidence of the conspiracies and the specific assassinations each week before the Watergate arrest took place. But the arrest of the men at the Watergate and the news that followed exemplified what I was trying to say happened in the process of assassinating people, the way you lose your trails, the way you run your offices. And, and I have written in, in that article in The Realist the succession of Richard Nixon to become president through the act of assassinations and that the man who has the office takes orders or works with these people so that you can see Haldeman and Ehrlichman working on foreign policy. No State Department. They're all of those departments, cabinets, are really 
washed out and he's working with a team and kissing her and he has a, a private team that decide what's going to happen in this country. I read that Pepsi Cola opened up in Russia. You know, all of Nixon's team are going to get the first franchises on this foreign trade, you know? They'll they'll carry their big business to China and Russia. Did you see that today? Pepsi Cola hits the Russians, you know. The biggest contributors to Richard Nixon, the Republicans. Yes, we should watch to see when it's going to China. <laughs> well, it'll be there and then there'll be the uh, golden arches from the <laughs> <laughs> I, there's the a, Moscow Golden Arches, yes. The Moscow Golden Arches. Well, I think the, the cabinet thing is important with the way the government's going to be shaping up and who's doing the shaping. Um, I think I worry about that because it, it certainly isn't in my mind to the best interests of the domestic programs that we could have that Richard Nixon has in, no intention of developing. I got one letter this week from somebody who mentioned Zodiac Press. Do you get the Zodiac Press here at the news service? Not there, anymore. No, there was, we did it. We did for a while. It, it, there was a review in it, in the Washington Star News by Virginia Armat. And there's a book review called La Fabulous Jackie, a book by Christian Kafarkas, Kafarkas, I can't read name, a former valet of Onassis. And the book is published in Paris. It's not in this country. He wrote La Fabulous Onassis, and he's done a, one on Jackie. And in the one on Jackie, the book review says, he says the following, soon after the funeral of JFK, Onassis offered to initiate a thorough investigation for Jackie. You know, Onassis was the first friend of hers that came into the White House right after the assassination when she came back from Dallas. He wanted to study the assassination to put Jackie's mind at rest. They had been close friends since 1959. After a couple of months' consideration, she agreed. This is from this particular review. Onassis then hired a team of four detectives who investigated the assassination for 19 months and, in effect, disposed of the conclusions of the Warren Commission and give the names of the real murderers. Uh, she, after she received the 27-page report, Jackie consulted with her closest friends and sent a copy of the report to President Johnson. <laughs> you know, she never would talk to him. She hasn't seen him or never would have anything to do with him after the assassination. The next morning, she received an anonymous phone call warning her to keep the report unpublished. The report is now locked away in Onassis's private safe at Gilfloda, G-L-Y-F-O-D-A, and it's protected all times by guards and a burglar alarm. And that was the review that the study exists. And maybe it would explain why she went there for protection. You know, after a while, the Secret Service wasn't to give her I think her children get protection, but she doesn't when she remarried. And she gets a lot of all that she needs, you know, with Onassis. Maybe she felt threatened. You know, a lot of people wondered about that relationship or marriage. But after he began to probe her, investigate, um, maybe she felt threatened. That's uh, an unusual and interesting book. You haven't seen it yet, No, it's though. only in Paris. I'll have to write to people. I have friends over in Europe, and uh, I'll try to get a copy. if there's any other reference to the... Assassinations. That's a well. The obvious thing is you wonder what's in that book, or what's on that paper, or what's on that report. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, there was another. Uh, we the elections went by so fast. We we didn't talk about the uh, uh, attor district attorney in L.A. There were two men running for district attorney down there. One is his name is Joseph Bush, and he's a protege of Evel Younger. The, the other is Vincent Bugliosi. Vincent Bugliosi. Uh, Bugliosi prosecuted the Manson case. And Bush, the Sirhan case. And the Sirhan, uh, I don't have respect for either of these men. But of the two, one's the protege. I, I say Bush is to Evel Young or what Agnew is to Nixon. You know, they're that close in the same ilk. And uh, Bush was attacking Bugliosi. Bugliosi didn't run on the campaign that if I am elected, I'll open up the Bobby Kennedy. But the Bobby Kennedy has to be opened up in the next year or so because the evidence is becoming massive and the material is mounting up about what happened down there. So they're sitting with something very heavy, but Bush can sit on it heavier than anybody because he represents Evel Younger, who was attorney general, district attorney at the time. So in the campaign last week before the elections, Bugliosi uh, was being attacked by Bush by saying that if he's elected, he'll become another Jim Garrison of New Orleans. He didn't say he's going to open up the Bobby because he didn't want to call attention, but he says he'll become the new Jim Garrison of the New Orleans district who was criticized on the John Kennedy inquiry. And so he got himself together what he called the Truth Squad 
to accumulate evidence on Bugliosi. Well, that's a new twist because Garrison had in New Orleans a truth squad that financed his work that he couldn't do as the DA, you know, do investigating. Now, Bugliosi is no longer with the DA. No. Uh, no he Bush was, asked for his resignation. Yeah, yeah. When he won. Yeah, that's right. And now he, was, he last week he lost just by a few counts. They were up all night. It was very close. And Bugliosi lost, but in the campaign issue... Uh, the garrison issue was raised by John Thorpe, the chairman of this truth squad, who was talking uh, to criminal lawyers, and he said, we don't want Jim Garrison tactics in Los Angeles. Now, it's funny that, that after uh, John Kennedy was killed, and people questioned the Warren Commission report, and, and Jim Garrison arrested Clay Shaw, uh, following that, Robert Kennedy was killed. And right away, Evelyn Younger said, we don't want another Jim Garrison. We'll have this thorough investigation with this truth squad, we don't want another Jim Garrison. Well, now L.A. is going to end up with one because he did to the Syrian case what uh, Earl Warren did to the, you know, there was no report on the Syrian case, but the trial certainly didn't cover the story. So they accused Bugliosi of wanting publicity to go into, they didn't mention Bobby ever, but he was seeking publicity and becoming another Jim Garrison. Well, the more famous the case, the more scandalous it gets publicity, you know. To attack him because he wants publicity is ridiculous. He's talking about, you know, he, the evidence probably. And I know he didn't run it as a campaign issue, but whoever was the DA is going to have to sit on that this year, you know, because it'll be coming up. The pressure on them to uh, stop sitting is increasing too. Yes, it, it's like a time bomb down in LA. It's mounting. And uh, I'm waiting for that movie to come out, The Second Gun, because a visual picture of the killing of Robert Kennedy is better than all the books. People are used to the visual picture. Okay, we'll be right back with part two of Dialogue Conspiracy after we take a break to identify the station. Near harm cases. Dialogue Conspiracy looks at current events, past events, future events, politics in general, and the everyday events that influence politics and are influenced thereby. Well, May, you wanted me to mention something here about uh, Brady Avery Legal Fund. Uh, yeah, last week we Brady, had... Brady had a lawsuit against some of the uh, governmental officials in Sand City. <laughs> the big city. And uh, he was uh, murdered a couple of weeks ago. And his partner, well, let's see, Brady and his partner both were notified that they could take a, instead of a... $42,000 settlement, they could accept a $3,000 settlement or go for a new trial, which is very expensive. And so uh, I take it from your note here that uh, there's a legal fund that's been set up for Brady Avery in his memory and his partner uh, yeah. in order for them to pursue a new trial against uh, Sand City. And you, where were well, Why did they mail it here to the station? Give the address, they can mail it. Okay, to if you'd like to mail station. it to the station, it will get to the proper people. Uh, mail it to the Brady Avery Legal Fund, care of KLRB, Box 3904 in Carmel. It's the Brady Avery Legal Fund, care of KLRB FM, Box 3904 in Carmel. And we'll see that uh, May relays it over to the uh, Avery family and to. Uh, um, Brady's partner. It would be a shame if they didn't get a chance to uh, have a retrial on this because they won a $42,000 suit with a jury trial and went through all of this work and Mr. Heisler in town donated his time and carried this thing and culminated and it seemed too good to be true that a person that had been oppressed and pushed around and uh, put out of business by a handful of people in Sand City to go before the courts and carry it up to the higher courts and win this in front of a jury. And then it sat around for a year and no money came through. And then all of a sudden they say, well, you're going to have a retrial. Take 3000 or have a retrial. And the energy and time spent away from their shop and everything was just overwhelming. The legal time, the physical time of going up to San Jose, the trials. And then uh, right after they were told they couldn't receive the money that they were supposed to get from the suit, uh, uh, two weeks later, Brady was shot and murdered, and the suit is pending, and if we don't raise money, there's a certain amount of the paper book just getting the old trial records and things. Nobody's going to make any money out of the donations. But they need about $1,200 minimum to open up the trial again. So if you have money that uh, you think you might spend on Christmas presents and you could give a little less and the thought would be as big, 
give the difference to the fund for there Brady's family. Uh, another item of, of business before we continue on. People are always asking where they can get a copy of the Realist magazine, which contains that uh, long, long article on the Watergate affair and uh, Richard Nixon et al. Uh, copies are still available at the Thunderbird Bookstore in Carmel Valley. Yeah, they're only 50 cents. Anything uh, in Santa Cruz. Yeah, the bookstore in Santa Cruz, too. Because the bookshop I, Santa Cruz. Yeah, I got letters here at the station this week, about six of them, with money and clothes. If you don't have a car and you can't get out to the Thunderbird, then write to KLRB. But if you are local people and you can get out there, uh, go out there and buy it there. Oh, is it 50 cents? 50 cents. Okay. And then the outset, uh, the Thunderbird told me they now have paperback editions of Jim Garrison's book, The Heritage of Stone. And before summer vacation, uh, uh, during the summer, uh, we didn't talk about the books or buying books to read. A lot of the college kids were away, but... Uh, I used to give titles of books each week, in addition to that Robert Kennedy thing, which I mentioned today. Um, get the Heritage of Stone, the paperback. It's a very good book by Jim Garrison, and read what he has to say. And it's not expensive. The Thunderbird has copies. And uh, put it in your collection of the history of the 60s and 70s, and uh, uh, just read it. It's more than I can do in one hour to even go into it. And it's a book you should own and hold and See, what would Jim Garrison saying and understand how the media put him down and what he was really trying to say about this country. Uh, now, I want to talk about... Uh, before you do that, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. One other item of business came to mind right now, and that is uh, the station has received, uh, I don't know, a couple letters a week, it averages, from people who want copies of the program, taped copies of the program, oh. or transcripts. Well, A, to make transcripts of these programs would be an impossible task, especially since we've done almost 90 programs now. And uh, it would be an impossible task on a weekly basis to make transcripts. There are no transcripts available. And B, uh, to make taped copies of the program uh, is almost impossible because although the programs are taped and uh, copies are made, uh, record copies are made, there we have no facilities for high-speed duplication of mass quantities of the programs. And so it's not a simple task to simply ask for a copy, a taped copy of the program. <laughs> what I might suggest is, if you uh, think you might want a taped copy of any of the programs and you are a regular listener, I might suggest that you just hook up a tape machine to your radio, which is not difficult at all. And uh, then if you decide after you've heard the program it's not worth saving, <laughs> then you can just erase it and use it for another program or record the Beatles on it or something. <laughs> but uh, it's very simple, and if you have uh, questions as to how you can uh, use your radio for uh, recording, um, to make you know, cassette. ask anybody at a record or, or a radio or TV show uh, store, and if uh, they can't help you, call us at KLRB and we'll help you. But, I mean, that's the way to do it. It isn't hard to do it, and, and quite a few people take cassettes every week and they play them over, and... Uh, we cover a lot of material usually, and it, it, you know they can listen to it and, and look up certain points. Find out where you made a mistake. <laughs> Actually, uh, in all the programs we've done, um, although we've issued many challenges, I've issued many challenges on behalf of the program for people to dispute facts. I can't remember uh, receiving a letter where anybody has a ever said what you said was a lie or, or attacked me or attacked you. I've got a couple of crank letters, but Which that's one? to be expected. I don't remember. Well, there was a couple of crank letters from, uh, well, I won't say what part of the Bay Area. Yeah. But I think, after the, well, they're from, from some from the uh, uh, Santa Cruz area. Oh, really? Yeah. You hid them from me. No, you saw them. Oh, I thought you they did. were compliments. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were cranks. So Listen, considering the, the amount of material we cover in the name. But I'm only there. a couple in, uh, in uh, <laughs> over a year, well over a year that we've been doing this program. So, uh, anyway, that business aside, that's how oh. to tape it. Don't. Please don't ask for taped copies of well, the program, guys. The many other, of you have. The other thing that there's the some tapes are going east now, and somebody copies them for me, and I make a cassette, you know, and, and send. If you send a blank cassette and three dollars for somebody to put it on there, I have a friend that will do it. But I don't ask them to do it for free because it takes a whole hour. It takes you know, turn a half hour and then turn it over. It takes their time. So, or two dollars if you if you want to send a blank cassette if it means that much and you want a copy of any show. Send a blank and a couple of dollars. I'll give it to a friend to make, and he'll mail it off to you. And that's fair enough. But I don't have. I have tapes of the back shows, and I would like to get somebody to put up money where we could duplicate them, you know, and send them or index them. But I haven't found any angel with money that 
we'll do it yet. If they would, it would be far out because we've covered a lot of material. It will be as pertinent a year from now as it was, you know, when we said it. And I wanted to do a little bit about the Billy Smith because that was on our local peninsula. And last week we talked about Brady Avery. Uh, when uh, Billy Smith first was brought over here from Vietnam in August of 71, I got a call from the news department. Were you here then? Were you the one who was carrying the news? And you heard him, you heard Luke McKissick talk to a group of people uh, that morning about uh, Billy Smith and the defense of Billy Smith. And you suggested if I go over and see him, he's over at that building on Broadway where the Harambe Clinic is now. And a few people that heard Luke McKissick on the peninsula that morning were upset because they got the impression that he was going to say, uh, right or wrong, the impression they got was he's going to say that Billy Smith is guilty. Because he's going to defend him on the basis of guilt because of racism and the, the climate of Vietnam at the time, that under those circumstances it encourages fragging. And I got a call from two or three people that day, and, and about four persons came to my home, and they, they were really very nervous, and they had listened to Dialogue Conspiracy, and they had heard me talk about Sir Han and, and Luke McKissick, who was his attorney, and they said, you better go over there tonight and see what's happening. So I went to this place and I sat there and Luke McKissick was there and Billy Smith's mother and his two brothers and his sister and I heard him talk and I listened to what he was saying and I because I was very concerned the only thing I knew about Mr. McKissick was that he was the attorney after the major case was over the prosecution of Sirhan Sirhan he came in on the tails of the case but when the evidence came in that Sirhan did not fire the fatal bullet or did not kill Robert Kennedy Luke McKissick was Sirhan's attorney, and he didn't do a thing about it or have any interest in that evidence. And uh, he denies it now, but I brought with me that evening a newspaper article that he was interviewed at the time that the new evidence came out about the second gun. And they said, well, what about this? What are you going to do for Sirhan? And, and Luke McKissick said, according to the L.A. Times, he said, even if my client didn't shoot, didn't kill Robert Kennedy, he came with the intention of doing it. And the evidence was very heavy that Sir Ann did not fire the fatal bullet. And I wondered what kind of an attorney is representing him. Well, the climate, the emotional climate, at the time that Billy Smith was brought over here was in August of 71. And Angela Davis was uh, arrested. You had a whole prison system with a lot of blacks and Chicanos in jail, um, potentially a, a scene that would be ripe for a riot or revolution preceding the 72 elections like we had in 68 when Martin Luther King was killed. And in that period, you had Angela Davis arrested, you had Juan Corona, the Soledad brothers, the Berrigan brothers, Raymond Marquez, Edward Whiteside out at Soledad, Bobby Seale, Rap Brown. You had a, the massacre of the Sharon Tate thing, La Bianca, the Oda family massacre in Santa Cruz, the Isla Vista riots, and you had a very volatile situation that our country was in. And all of these, I knew that all of these were planted evidence and patsies to create little Reichstag fires all along the line. You think the Hells Angels are tied in with that? Yes. Yeah, we've done, I've done that before. Maybe we can do a show next week because of the rest now, the Sonny Barger on trial, if I remember, do it next week. Must, uh, they... Well, and Two also, people discovered in the buried in the farm up there. Yeah, the, they call them the Manson girls. We could do that. But getting back to this thing, I went down that evening, and I listened to what Mr. McKissick was saying, and I took notes. I brought them here. These are the notes I took that night. I sat in the room, and I was writing off like it, just everything he was saying. And when he was through talking about how he was going to defend Billy Smith, and I'll show you what he said at that time, um... I just said to him, how did you get in on this case? Because uh, any person that gets close to Sirhan or, or uh, James Ray or any of the alleged assassins, Arthur Bramer, have particular clearances. They just don't get in on these cases uh, without some special way. And Billy Smith, well, I considered a political case, and it was very volatile. And I asked him, how did you get in this case? And he said, what are you taking all those notes for? Why are you writing all this down, you know? And who are you? And I said, well, I'm May Brussel. And he recognized the name. I've done a lot of churning or tried to down L.A. And uh, he said, are you May Brussel? I said, yes, and I, I'm watching you. I said, I, I study political assassinations. Any attorney related to political assassinations, I watch them. And I'm going to watch you. And I want to see what you're going to do with Billy Smith. And I asked Billy Smith's mother, where did you find out about Luke McKissick? And she 
passed it off to his sister, and the sister didn't want to tell me, and the brothers seemed rather hostile, and there were other people in the room, including some attorneys in town, you know, and they got very angry that I was interfering with the evening uh, presentation, and I was very angry at what he was going to do, and I'll tell you what he was going to do, and then I, we'll, I'll tell you what the discussion we had in the room afterwards. Um, because of this volatile political situation, uh, I was worried. So what he said then, and this is totally different than the defense of the case now, and I bring it up for this reason. What he said that evening was he was going to attack the military system and that he would attack the jury system, whereby the all-white military jury would be prejudiced against the black, and he would attack... Okay, he did that. Yeah, he would attack the legality of the war and the conditions of Vietnam. Okay, the judge told him he couldn't do that. That's right, and the psychiatric evidence. He was going into the state of mind, the racism, the relevant... He did not do that. That's right. What he was going to do then was to get... He said, I'll get every black writer, and we'll make uh, and psychiatrist and we'll go in to uh, men like Cobbs uh, wrote Black Rage and he was going to get these writers and psychiatrists I already could see the Ruby trial with streams of psychiatrists Jack Ruby's one minute epilepsy that he never had before or after Sirhan's one minute hypnosis with the mirrors in the ambassador hotel the stream of psychiatrists just ends you up on death row it doesn't convince the jury and it has nothing pertinent to the case and the, if you sit at Fort Ord and put the military on trial, you can't say Billy Smith because these are military people. He said, I'm going to put the military on trial, these were his words, and will call attention to how the blacks are treated differently in the military. He said Billy was a high school dropout. Or he was high, in high school and he was drafted. He didn't want the military. He was down on the military treatment. He was afraid of being killed and he didn't want to kill. And Luke said, I'm going to plan to generate a lot of publicity. Well, this is the publicity is what wouldn't help, like Carl Chessman, Sacco Vanzetti, the Rosenbergs. I saw a pattern here that was very similar to a lot of cases I've seen. And he was going to generate publicity, and he was going to contact Nixon on the inequality, which is okay, the way Callie was treated as against Billy Smith. And he was going to bring out public uh, sympathies to understand fragging and why you have fragging. And he said, I'll bring every major black writer, and we'll bring authors on attitudes generated by war. And he was going to ask the jury to see the, the conditions of war and what kind of a war, what the war brings on, what kind of problems. Well, we talked about that, and after he was through, uh, we went outside, and the family was kept apart from where I was. And I said to him, look, he, in the course of the evening, he mentioned something about the fragmentation bomb and, and that it was going to be tested in Japan, that that was the only place it could test it. And I said, look, the prosecution can't be the only place. The defense and the prosecution can't both be testing the same weapon and the instrument, and the handling of the evidence by the military is like the military handling the evidence on the John Kennedy assassination. Uh, I said, if you would stick, from what he said that evening, the emphasis that he was going to put was on these five things, the jury system, the legality of the war, the conditions of Vietnam, and the psychiatric evidence, those four things. And I spoke to him, and I was really mad, and I said, when are these cases going to stick to the evidence in the case? Because so many people are innocent, and these are political paths. They're, they're political paths he singled out, and when you stick to the actual uh, witnesses that were there, not hearsay or third person, and you stick to the evidence of the case, the chances are that a patsy could be cleared. Because when you're doing this now, like the corona thing, each day it's unfolding clearer and clearer. The bank notes and everything. How much could be planted on Juan Corona? You say, I'll be surprised if he gets it. Well, I, I just said to him that, that I um, am interested to see how attorneys work to take these political cases and how they avoid the actual evidence and get into these theoretical things about the psychology, accepting the psychology that he did the fragging because... He is oppressed. Well, I never did see Mr. McKissick again. He knows that I have all this research on the Robert Kennedy thing. Uh, if I had anything he didn't have, he never asked to see me. He was on the peninsula for months, and he had no interest at all in, in having any contact with me, which was all right. And I stayed away from the Billy Smith trial. I didn't go one day. And I did express to people in L.A., mutual friends, researchers that he is close with, and people that he knows my feelings about what was going to happen up here. And everything was reversed, and it took on, the trial took on an entirely different tone. You were there every day, Phil. And 
the defense wasn't anything like this. This no, is it, what it wasn't. Huh? It wasn't anything like it that. It wasn't what, anything what like he that. said that night. That's right. And I'm glad he wasn't. And I'm glad that I had that small confrontation because uh, I think that if somebody had come up to the lawyers of these other cases and challenged them very early in the game about what they were doing or blew their cover or exposed the, the two ways to defend a person who is a political patsy, those patsies would get off. So the trial ended up well, and I stayed away from it. But uh, I feel that it was starting way off in August. It was starting bad. See, and that was the time. That was just two weeks before George Jackson was killed in the San Quentin Six. And there was, there was a very volatile time between the black-white relationships, which Washington cooled off. And things, you know, each one, the cases went their natural course with good lawyers who were dedicated. And Angela Davis sticking to the evidence. And with the Soledad brothers, the, the trial there, the men sticking with the evidence and the witness, we saw a whole new change in a chance to get these political patsies off and out because that's what they were yes uh now after we've talked about billy smith for about five or ten minutes we should explain who he is for those who don't know billy smith is a army private who was uh, arrested in vietnam at benoit army base on uh, march 15 1971 for the uh fragging deaths fragmentation grenade deaths of two officers and the uh, injuring of a third officer while they were asleep in their barracks and uh, the prosecution case that was uh, put forth by the uh, Army prosecutors was that Billy Smith hated his commanding officer and first sergeant, and although he didn't kill them, he meant to kill them. Uh, the Army said that he knew that they were sleeping or believed they were sleeping in the room where the two other officers were killed, and their key evidence against Billy Smith was a grenade pin taken from Smith's pocket, which on the basis of scientific uh, experiments conducted by an Army tool marks expert the army claimed matched a grenade <laughs> pin the grenade pin taken from smith matched a grenade spoon uh, found outside the room where the uh, grenade exploded so that that is billy smith in, in way of an explanation the smith was acquitted of all the charges except one charge of <laughs> kicking a military policeman in the groin and spitting upon him when he was arrested so well you know if evidence were planted on you <laughs> he'd kick him too i think i think considering that he was found innocent of all charges. The spitting was justified. You know, imagine being trapped. If he didn't have uh, people there working for him, you know, dedicating the hours which they did to this thing, he easily could be in jail the rest of his life. And I'm hoping that many cases up at San Quentin now that I think about will be overturned as these lawyers move along and stick just with the evidence of the case. See, uh, all of the research in to the political assassinations that I've done starts with the ballistic evidence and the fingerprints and, and the actual physical evidence of the case. And then you branch out to broader theories or speculations because when the physical evidence doesn't match, you begin to say, well, who planted it? And that becomes hypothetical. Now, the letter that I got, this was a long time off, and I'm really sorry. Uh, it's one that we said, and we say it all the time, if you have anything on the assassinations that you want answered, I will answer those. It, this is a common letter that I get from people. Um, they ask me a question. They think, many people think, that John Kennedy was no different than the power structure of the establishment. And this letter is from somebody in Monterey who uh, reads the realist and is listening to KLRB, who under his uh, way of thinking considered John Kennedy not as a martyr who stood out against an invisible government, but as somebody who was part of the military-industrial complex. And he said to me, people, the man who wrote this said, people picture Kennedy as a martyr who attempted courageously to counteract the invisible government. But this assumption is false because John Kennedy, for all of his liberal rhetoric, always acted in such a way that I suspect the Pentagon, the CIA, and big business would be happy to approve of. And it goes, this person said, he set up the CIA operation that engineered the Bay of Pigs. Well, that's false. He inherited the planning of the Bay of Pigs and found out just at the time the operation was taking place that it was done behind his back, and they told him it was already an operation in effect when he took the presidency. He didn't set up the clandestine operation of the Bay of Pigs or engineer it at all. Uh, this person said he pronounced a demagogic diatribe for refugees in Miami. He didn't do that. Uh, then it goes on, he was close to blowing up the world with the nuclear weapons, and this was not true either. 
uh, and he blockaded Cuba. Uh, these things were not important in the general picture of things. Uh, the question is also that was asked me, he did everything in his power to c cater to the people who are accused of gunning him down and what motive would they have in killing him? Well, just briefly, we have about four minutes left or three. Uh, for one thing, the Pentagon Papers, if you read them very carefully, don't show a continuation of policy between Johnson and Kennedy. They show that Kennedy would have had all troops out by 1964. And to have a few people over there, even espionage, gathering information isn't wrong considering how large Asia is, but to have all troops out by 64 is very clear in the Pentagon Papers. And uh, he didn't approve of the policy of DM and the brutalization and the exploitation of the people. He, he didn't feel that a fascist dictator is better than a communist. He didn't support Diem, and he did not want troops in there. He was pulling them out, and the escalation right after his death is very clear in the Pentagon Papers, starting in November 24th with Lyndon Johnson. Um, right away, the nuclear test ban treaty was something that the powers that be did not appreciate, and he had price items of the steel. There's a whole book out on why this, the U.S. steel is in on uh, killing Kennedy. Uh, Robert Kennedy was the first person who was going out after organized crime in the syndicate, not for votes, but he sincerely wanted to break that up as the attorney general. It's the first time in all the years that J. Edgar Hoover had used people like Lansky as agents of the FBI, and now he, Robert Kennedy was going into the syndicate and mafia as the attorney general. He was heavy for the oil depletion allowance, which the Texans and the large, rich oil people want to hold on to, and he was very open about that, Kennedy was. And the Civil Rights Bill, they we're going backwards from where he was. He fought hard for a Civil Rights Bill, and there are a lot of Southerners and racist people that did not appreciate the position he took or his brother took in sending troops down there to open up the college. Uh, in Latin America, he gave speeches about uh, dividing the wealth and participating in the sharing of the resources. And so that's your answer to the question? And, he, and the minute he was assassinated, the Dominican Republic, the military was recognized. We, we just don't have much time. That, that's eight things. There are nine reasons that he didn't go along with them. And so uh, CJ's question for Monterey is, what possible motive in light of the above items cited in his letter could have initiated a conspiracy to plot his death? And, and I'm saying uh, there were a lot of reasons. When you talk about civil rights, you're talking about the whole labor market in this country and nuclear weapons and armament budgets. And uh, he was not going. He was the son of a rich man, but he was not a spoiled uh, Cold War strategist. Well, I'm glad we got to answer that letter <laughs> from September 9th. And if any of you have letters, that, problems, or questions that you want me to answer on any of the just, assassinations... Just say on there, answer this one quickly. <laughs> Because we're about, uh, there's so many letters coming in, I think we're about uh, two, three months behind. But, but we will, we'll answer. try and catch up. A lot of them are answered personally, I know. I think you should you, write, and we will answer them, because I promise I'll get around to it. Now, May's going to take her stack of mail home and continue working to catch up and uh, working on the material for next week's program. We'll see you. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy a public affairs presentation of KLRB News. If you have questions that you want answered on future programs or any comments, write Dialogue Conspiracy, KLRB, Box 3904.